Hello, I'm Mrs. Goodlett, and today we will be reading Alan Gratz, Ground Zero, a novel of 9-11. Rashmina, page 145, Son of a Donkey. Pasoon, Rashmina called. She didn't understand. One minute, Pasoon had been right in front of her, and the next, poof, he was gone. But how? The path they'd been following stretched slowly and steadily up the hill. You could see up to the next ridge and all the way down into the ravine below, and there were no big rocks or trees for Pasoon to hide behind. Pasoon, you son of a donkey, Rashmina cried. Where did you go? She spun looking all around, but Pasoon had completely disappeared. Rashmina started to panic. If she lost him, if he found the Taliban before she'd been able to talk him out of it, Rashmina started up the path. If Pasoon had somehow made it up the long hill while he she wasn't looking, she would see him from the top of the ridge. She ran halfway there and then stopped. No, there was no way Pasoon could have sp sprinted all the way in, a few, in the few seconds she hadn't been looking. It was too far. He has to be around here somewhere, Rashmina thought. But where? Rashmina came back down the path to where she had planted the seed and opened her senses. She scanned the terrain in minute detail, lingering over every rock, every bush. She listened for the slightest sounds on the wind, a snapping twig, a scuffling footstep, an accidental rock fall, nothing. But then, tink. Rashmina caught the smallest metallic sound, almost no louder than her heartbeat. She wouldn't have even heard it if she hadn't been listening so hard. The sound had come from a steep wall of rock along the path. She moved closer to the wall, listening, watching. But there's nothing here, she thought. She put her hands to the rock face as though there was some kind of secret door Pasoon had walked through. But no. Rasmina sighed and looked down at her feet. Wait. Were those the faint marks of shoes in the dirt? She crouched down below. It was only when she put her head almost all the way to the ground that she saw it beneath the rocky overhang, the entrance to a cave. Pasoon, that sneaky rat, the Afghan mountains were full of hidden caves like this. Some caves were no bigger than the snow leopards who liked to sleep in them, but others went deep into the mountains, carved out long ago by ancient waters and smoothed into hiding places by decades of jihad fighters. Pasoon must have known the cave was there and waited until she wasn't looking to scramble inside. The entrance was just big enough for a grown person to squeeze through, and Rashmina wiggled inside. Beyond the entrance, there was a room to sit up and then stand, but it was pitch black and cold in the cave. She waited for her eyes to adjust, but it was too dark. There was only a sliver of light from the entrance to orient herself. Basoon, Rashmina whispered. The little toad had, had to be somewhere. He could be standing right next to her for all she knew, but the cave might also go deep within the mountain. She was going to have to go further inside to find out. Rashmina put her hands out in front of her, feeling her way through the darkness. Almost immediately, she ran into something about thigh level and her heart caught in her throat. Wood scraped softly against rock. And there was a clink of glass, a small table maybe, with something on it. She felt tentatively in the dark. Yes, a table, and in the middle of it, a lantern. She could tell from its shape, and if there was a lantern, there might be. She patted the tabletop until she found it, a small plastic lighter. Rashmina struck the flint on the lighter, and suddenly she could see her hands. She squinted in the glare. There was a glass lamp on the table, like the one Rashmina's family had at home, and this lamp still had oil in it. Rashmina lit the wick and wore a warm glow cast light all around her. Something was stacked against the smooth walls of the cave just beyond the edge of her light, and Rashmina stepped closer with the lantern to see what it was. Weapons. The cave was filled with them. Rifles, RPGs, boxes of bullets, unburied landmines. The metallic sound Rashmina had heard outside must have been Pasoon tripping over a weapon in the dark. Rashmina brought the lantern down for a closer look. The weapons were made by different countries. She recognized some of the languages written on the weapons and others she guessed at. English, Russian, French, German, Spanish, Korean, Chinese. No, 
Pasto or Arabic though. Afghanistan didn't make the weapons. They just bought them and shot them. It was the big countries that made money selling weapons to the little countries. Who they killed with those weapons wasn't any of the big countries' concern. What would happen, Rashmina wondered, if the big countries stopped selling weapons to the little countries? How would Afghanistan and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and Iran and the countries around them fight each other and the rest of the world with bows and arrows, swords, rocks, and fists? Maybe Rashmina thought they couldn't fight it, wouldn't fight at all. Maybe they would spend their time doing something else instead, like building factories and schools and hospitals. But that was never going to happen, and Rashmina knew it. She knew, too, as a chill ran down her back, that what she was looking at right now was a Taliban weapons cache, a big one. Rashmina turned, and there was Pasoon standing right next to her. It appeared out of nowhere like a ghost. Rashmina screamed, and Pasoon lunged for the lantern. Rashmina jumped, and the lantern clattered to the floor. Krish! The glass lantern shattered, and thwomp, the spilled oil ignited. No, the explosives, Rashmina cried. Help me put the fire out, Pasoon yelled. Together, they kicked dirt at it, and Rashmina used her headscarf to beat out the last of the flames. She was still scared that one of the weapons might go off, and now it was pitch dark in the cave again. Get out! We have to get out, Pasoon told her. Pasoon scrambled out first and helped Rashmina through the hole. When she was back on her feet, she shoved her brother hard. You idiot, she cried. You could have killed both of us in there. You're the one who dropped the lantern, he told her, because you popped up like some evil spirit and scared me to death, Rashmina yelled. They were both shaking so much they had to sit down on the ground. When Rashmina could breathe again, she turned to her brother. How did you even know that place was there? Kasun looked away. Darwish and Amon showed it to me. Rashmina blew out a laugh. Darwish and Amon, of course. Pasoon got up angrily and stalked off, the, off up the path. Pasoon, wait, Rashmina called. She got to her feet and followed him. I'm sorry, please stop this foolishness and come home. More and Baba need you. I need you. But Pasoon was done talking. Rashmina glared at her twin brother's back as he walked away. Why couldn't he see there was another path, another future? Why did he have to follow so, do so doggedly in the footsteps of all the other boys who had left home for the Taliban before him? High up on a ridge, Rashmina spied a familiar rock with a phone number painted on it, the same one she and Pasoon had passed a couple of years ago, the spot she was going to all along. The rifle's not going to be there, she told Pasoon. It can't be. But it was. They passed the painted rock and came to this small plateau again, and there right where Pasoon had left it, was the same Soviet rifle he had used to shoot at the American army base. Pasoon picked up the rifle and checked to see if it was still loaded. Apparently it was. Pasoon, what are you doing? Rashmina asked. Pasoon slid the bolt back in place and took aim over the side of the mountain. I'm going to call the Taliban, he said. <laughs>